morning, Bethel. Thank you for joining us this Sunday morning. We're so glad to have you again, even if it is over the airwaves. We're glad that you've tuned in. If you're a visitor with us today, thank you as well for joining. Perhaps a Google search has led you to Bethel. We don't take that lightly. We're glad that you've joined us, and we pray that you'll be blessed by the hearing of the word. We are praying for our country. We're praying for the world. We're praying for leaders and the medical staff that's out there um, combating this coronavirus. And we're praying for you as well that you remain sane in your house. Um, even at, during this time of seclusion. We're praying for your spiritual growth. We're praying that you spend time with the Lord to hear from Him, specifically for what He has for you. Don't forget, we're also going through um, a time of prayer for our country and for the world through Unite714.com. If you would join us for this prayer time each day at 7.15 in the morning and 7.15 at night, there's a prayer guide at uh, Unite714.com. love for you to join us and follow along. Prayer is powerful and effective. Okay, so during this time, we're going to look at Judges chapter um, 16. We're going to kind of look at 14, 15, and 16 in this sermon, but we're going to look at the life of Samson again. We saw last week that God called him out for divine purpose. And so this week, we're going to see that even though God's called him out for divine purpose, the enemy is going to be at work as well to try and stop Samson from achieving what God has uh, planned for his life. And I want us to remember that, that God has a plan for each and every one of us, even before the foundations of the world were laid. Ephesians tells us that, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and his will. God has called us for a purpose. He chose us before the foundations of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. And He's got a purpose for us as we're separated or set apart to Him to accomplish. And God wants to use us to reach the world for Jesus Christ. And the enemy has another plan for our lives. It's to detract us and distract us from the plan that God has and to show us all this world has so that we would go after that and despise the calling of God on our life and be useless. But greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Amen. And so I just want us to look at how Samson struggled with this. And I want you to remember, God's called you for a purpose. He's called you for a purpose. It's not for doom and defeat. It's for righteousness. And it's for revealing the plan of God to the lost world. God came to seek and to save that which was lost. And he uses us as his vessels to reach the world. Even if the enemy toys with us, the, the Lord will use our lives to combat the enemy while reaching people for Christ. God knows people need to be delivered from the grips of the enemy. And God has the perfect plan. It's called faith in Jesus Christ. It's the gospel message given to all who would believe. And so today I'm praying that you would see that you've been called out and chosen for a divine purpose to reach people for Christ. But let's not forget the enemy is working behind the scenes. But let's see how Samson, how Samson dealt with this in his life. And maybe we can learn some things from the life of Samson that would keep us on track. And so I've called this sermon, Focus on the Finish. Stay focused on the finish. Don't get sidetracked. Don't look elsewhere. Continue to gaze on the author and perfecter of your faith, and you will be blessed. The Bible says in Judges chapter 16, it says, One day Samson went down to Gaza where he saw a prostitute. He went in to spend the night with her. The people of Gaza were told, Samson is here. So they surrounded the place that they, and lay in wait for him all night at the city gate. They made no move during the night, saying, At dawn we will kill him. But Samson lay there only until the middle of the night. Then he got up and took hold of the doors of the city gate together with the two posts and tore them loose, bar and all. He lifted them to his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Sometime later, he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, See if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him so that we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, Tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. Samson answered her, If anyone ties me with seven fresh thongs that have not been dried, I'll become as weak as any other Man, Then the rulers of the Philistines brought her seven fresh thongs that had not been dried, and she tied him up with them. 
With the men hidden in the room, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the thongs as easily as a piece of string snaps when it becomes close to a flame. So the secret of his strength was not discovered. Then Delilah said to Samson, You have made a fool of me. You have lied to me. Come now, tell me how you can be tied. He said, If anyone ties me securely with new ropes that have never been used, I'll become as weak as any other man. So Delilah took new ropes and tied them, or tied him with them. Then with the men hidden in the room, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the ropes off his arms as if they were threads. Delilah said to Samson again, Until now you have been making a fool of me and, try, and lying to me. Tell me how you can be tied. He replied, If you weave the seven braids of my head into the fabric on the loom and tighten it with a pin, I'll become as weak as any other man. So while he was sleeping, Delilah took the seven braids of his head, wove them into the fabric, and tightened it with a pin. Again, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and pulled up the pin and the loom with the fabric. Then she said to him, How can you say, I love you, when you won't confide in me? This is the third time you have made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. With such nagging and prodding him day after day, until he was tired to death. So she nagged him. She prodded him day after day until he was tired to death. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been set apart. I have been a Nazarite set apart to God since birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines, Come back once more. He's told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the, seven, or with the silver in their hands. Having put, him on to, or having put him to sleep on her lap, she called the man to shave off the seven braids of his hair, and so began to subdue him, and his strength left him. Then she called Samson. The Philistines are upon you. He woke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Then the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza, binding him with bronze shackles. They sent him into, gr into grinding in the prison. But his hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Father, we do thank you, Lord, for the word. We're praying, Father, that you show us, God, just by your glorious grace, Lord, by the Holy Spirit. We're praying, Spirit, that you would show us the truth for our lives here, that we are to remain focused on the finish, not to get sidetracked by this world, God, because you have a plan for our lives. Lord, help us just to understand what that plan is for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Samson is a man who was called out from birth to be a Nazarite. God had called him out in chapter 13. No, Manoah and his wife were told that you will conceive and give birth to a son. Now then, drink no wine or other fermented drink and do not eat anything unclean because the boy will be a Nazarite of God from birth until the day of his death. He was called out from birth. Numbers chapter 6 talks about the Nazarite vow that people would take for a season of separation unto God. But Samson was called out from birth. Just like you and I were called out according to Ephesians, we were predestined to be what? Blameless in his sight. Before the creations of the world, he chose us to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ. Samson's birth was to begin to be the one that would deliver Israel from the Philistines. He was going to be the beginning of the deliverance of Israel from the Philistines, the Bible says. So there's a clear plan and a clear path for Samson. He just had to remain set apart and holy, and he was called to that even before birth. So this was God's divine plan for Samson. And as God holds everything together, God would keep Samson strong and, and following this path by his power and his strength. Not by Samson's strength, but by the Spirit of God's power that would come over him when he needed it. And so God was orchestrating all of this so that God's people would be delivered from 
the enemy. And that's what God has chosen us for. He has chosen us each individually to be a deliverer of people from the enemy. How? By sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, by allowing ourselves to listen to the Lord when he brings us across the path of those people who need deliverance, that we would share boldly in the power of the Spirit the gospel message, that they might believe and receive salvation, forgiveness of their sins, and freedom from the enemy. But the enemy, on the other hand, has a plan as well. And his plan is to deceive us and to distract us from keeping our eyes fixed on the finish. See, we're called to keep our eyes fixed on the author and perfecter of our faith. That is Jesus Christ. But the enemy wants us to take our eyes off of him and to look elsewhere that we might become useless and defeated instead of victorious and more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. And so we look back at Samson's life in chapter 14. And Samson begins to look with his eyes. Samson begins to look at things that are not to be toyed with. Just like Adam and Eve in the garden, Eve looked at the fruit. She saw that it was good and pleasing to the eye, and it, it was good for her body for nutrition. <laughs> and so she ate of it. And Samson begins in chapter 14 to look at things that would ensnare him, and they were women. I wonder what in our life that we keep looking at that continues to ensnare us from the plan and the purpose that God has for our lives and sidetracks us and wastes time. And year after year, day after day, hour after hour, we notice time slipping away because we're so trapped into just looking and gazing away from the plan that God has for us into the things of this world. It's there to sidetrack you. The enemy is smart, but I'm here to tell you, you need to keep your eyes focused on the author and perfecter of our faith. That's Jesus Christ, because he has a plan. He has a purpose for your life, and that is to reach people for Jesus Christ chapter 14, Samson went down to Timnah and he saw there a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and his mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. You see, Samson had a problem with his eyes. He was looking at women and he was looking at the wrong kind of women. He was looking at people that were of the other Race. He was looking at Philistine women when God said that you should not intermarry. That you know Israel's been in all kinds of trouble. God's people have been in sin cycle after sin cycle after sin cycle through disobedience. And here Samson, the mighty warrior that's called out even before his birth, he is looking instead of at the purpose that God has for him. He is looking at the things of this world. He's looking at women, and he is being lustful because the lust of the eyes is what's grabbing his heart. And he saw this woman and he told his parents, go get her for me. She's exactly what I need. And his parents tried to say, no, isn't there somebody else from, from our people? You know, she's a Philistine. You shouldn't be going after her. He said, no, I looked at her. I saw her. I desire her. I want her. And they go and they get him. Along the way there, um, a lion comes and Samson, in the power of God, rips this lion apart and the, the carcass is dead. The Spirit of the Lord comes upon him in power and he rips the lion apart. Uh, but he doesn't tell his parents about this. Why is this? Because he has just now done something else that he shouldn't have done. He touched a dead animal. But he goes down and he marries this lady. And there he has a feast, a, 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 a week-long feast with the people of the wedding party. And he tells this riddle, and they don't understand the riddle, and they get his wife to tell him all about the riddle. And Samson's like, you know, if you hadn't plowed with the heifer, you wouldn't have known the answer to this riddle. So he goes down and he kills um, 30 men, 30 of their men. He strips them of their clothes and their belongings, and he gives them back to the people of his wife's father's house, and he moves on. And I think that we have to remember here that in chapter 14, what's happening is that Samson's trying to live a normal life with a wife. He doesn't really want to fight, but he keeps getting snared by the enemy. He's looked at a lady that he shouldn't have looked at. He's demanded that he marry somebody outside of who God has said to marry. He's unequally yoked. He's not keeping his vow as a Nazarite. He's ripping apart carcasses. He's ripping apart lines. He's having a feast with uh, the wedding party. He returned there to uh, to marry this lady, 
So he says that in verse 10 now, his father went down to see the woman and Samson made a feast there. In verse 10 of chapter 14, when he appeared, he was uh, given 30 companions. Let me tell you a riddle. So he's looking at a woman, he is touching dead animals, and he is now feasting. I mean, this is, a, this is a long feast that's going on, and of course there's drinking there. And so that's what the word, the root word of that word feast means, is to drink as well. And so he's doing all the things that he should not be doing. And he gets ensnared with the enemy. And it's amazing that if he would have just stayed the course with the Lord and been set apart and holy as a Nazarite, there wouldn't have been the beginning of all these issues. And it just takes one thing. It just takes that one compromise in our lives. It just takes that one look away from the author and perfecter of our faith. And in a moment, we have an engagement with the enemy. And that's the point of the enemy. He wants to get you engaged in listening, just like he did Eve in the garden. He wants to toy you and to pull you in that you would stop and give him the time of day. When the Bible says, do not give the enemy even a foothold. Don't let him get that big toe in the door because the minute that he gets that toe in the door, the fight is on. And the devil does not play fair and square. It's an all-out street battle. It's a street fight. No rules, no referees, no holds bar, and he's down to kick you, to kill, steal, and destroy. He's out there to, to destroy you, to annihilate you. And this is what's happening with Samson. A man that's called out by God is now looking and doing the things that he shouldn't do. He's entangled with those things that he shouldn't do. He's actually forgetting the purpose that God has set aside for him. He is to be the beginning of the deliverance of the Philistines. But the enemy wants to stop him and to entangle him and to snare him and to shackle him up so that he is rendered useless. And Samson moves on into chapter 15. It says later on that at the time of harvest, Samson took a young goat and went to visit his wife. He said, I'm going to my wife's room, but her father would not let him go in. I was so sure thoroughly that you hated her, so I gave her to your friend. You see, Samson, after the, uh, the Philistines figured out the riddle because his wife told them the answer, he left his wife and had nothing to do with her. Now he wants to go back and see her. And in fact, he's, she's been given to someone else. And so that enrages Samson. And so what does Samson do? He gets creative with the enemy, right? He takes some foxes and he ties their tails together and he lights them on fire during the harvest time and he lets these the hundreds of foxes go in the fields and it burns down the Philistines' um, grain and the vineyards and the olive groves, as you see in chapter 15, verse 5. So the Philistines asked, who did this? They were told Samson, the Timnite's son-in-law, because his wife was given to his friend. And so what happened? So the Philistines went up and burned her and her father to death. Samson said to them, since you've acted like this, I won't stop until I get my revenge on you. See, the enemy is toying with Samson. Samson wants to go back and make right with his wife, just like we. We want to live right for the Lord. But it seems like when we begin to do something right, the enemy kicks in and does something else. <laughs> The enemy um, worked through this where Samson's wife was given to his friend from the wedding party and Samson tries to go back and reconcile, finds out that she was given to someone else. So it, it upsets Samson so much that he wigs out and he's like, I'm going to get back at the Philistines. I'm going to get back at them. And he burns their fields. <laughs> and then what happens? The enemy kills his wife and her family. You see, it seems like every time we get one step forward, one time we're trying to do something right, the enemy kicks in and knocks us 10 feet back. We try to, to apologize to somebody that we've done wrong, and we go home and our, and our family is a disarray, or you lose your job. Something happens, and every time the enemy sees you doing something right, he's always going to fight you and kick you when you're down to get you to come back around and engage with him and tie you up. Samson is in a back and forth battle with the enemy and the enemy is thrilled with it because it ties Samson up. It gets him off track of being right and set apart unto God for the purpose and plan of God. He's now engaging with the enemy instead of just saying, you know what, I'm going to keep my eyes focused on the finish, on the author and perfecter of my faith, on the purpose that he has for me. Instead of doing that, he's now toying with the enemy, just like Eve did in the garden where the enemy snuck in, usurped the man and talked to, at, to Eve. She engaged in the conversation with him. Anytime you begin to engage in the battle or a conversation with the enemy, he has got you. 
You need at that moment to keep your eyes focused on the finish and on the finisher of our faith, Jesus. He's got a plan for you beyond the pettiness that you're tied up with. He's got a plan for you and a purpose for you. So the Philistines went up and they burned her and her father in chapter 15. Verse 7, Samson said to them, Since you've acted like this, I won't stop until I get my revenge on you. See, he's, he's now getting dragged in until I get my revenge on you. He attacked them viciously and slaughtered many of them. Then he went down and stayed in the cave in the rock of Atom. The Philistines went up and camped in Judah, spreading out near Lehi. The men of Judah asked, Why have you come to fight us? <laughs> Asking the Philistines, Why have you come to to fight us. We have come to take Samson prisoner, they answered, to do to him as he did to us. Then 3,000 men from Judah went down to the cave in the rock of Atom and said to Samson, don't you realize that the Philistines are rulers over us? What have you done to us? He answered, I merely did to them what they did to me. They said to him, We've come to tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines. Samson said, Swear to me that you won't kill me yourself. Agreed, they answered. We will only tie you up and hand you over to them. You will, we will not kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes and led him up to the rock. Isn't it funny that when the same time that the enemy is trying to sidetrack you and, and is hot on your tail, getting you to engage in all kinds of filth or bad habits or, or attitudes that are ungodly, there are some of your own people trying to tie you up, trying to bring you down as well. Samson's trying to do right, and yet here, here uh, the Philistines are the ones that are, in, are the enemies, but here God's people, the, the, the tribe of Judah, come and they confront Samson. These are God's people as well. They come to confront Samson and say, Hey, look, don't you know the Philistines are rulers over us? What are you doing? We're here to tie you up. And isn't it funny that when you're trying to break free and do what's right and go the path that, God's, that God has for you and finish the race well and, and be used by God, that even people in your own camp will come up to you and say, Wait, time out. What are you doing? Stop. We're going to tie you up. We're going to keep you from doing what you're supposed to be doing. It's a sad day when even people in the house of God or the family of God tie you up to stop you from being free from the enemy. You need to get around people that want to be free as well because there is freedom in Christ. And if you obey my word, you show yourself my disciples. And in doing so, you'll be free. The word of God will set you free and you'll be free indeed, the Bible says. Don't get around. Get out of the boat, Peter, because I've got a plan for you to walk on water and to experience me in a brand new way. Get away from those people that are binding you and keeping you from experiencing me. God's own tribe of Judah was tying up Samson, the one that was called out from the very beginning beginning to be a deliverer for Israel from the Philistines and yet God's own people handcuffed him and tied him up to stop him from being free to carry on the purpose isn't it funny when you have such a call on your life and people can't comprehend it and yet they tie you up and you find yourself going in circles round and round even fighting the, the, the people of God they don't see your vision they don't want to try anything different they've just kind of settled into the, the status quo and in fact they're used to being overcome by the enemy don't you realize the Philistines rule over us no that's not how it should be you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus there's no condemnation you are a soldier of the king you're not to be oppressed by the enemy you are to be freed by the Savior that you could go forth for the mission of God that is to help bring the gospel message that people might be free the captives would be set free don't let people with small minds and small visions keep you from being used for the purpose of God <laughs> free yourself don't offer yourself to be tied up so Samson he's he gets tied up by his own own people and, and then uh, it says that when he goes off, God gives him the power. As he approached Lehi, the Philistines came towards him, shouting, The Spirit of the Lord came upon me. 
came upon him in power. The ropes on his arms became like charred flax, and the bindings dropped from his hands. Finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey, he grabbed it, and he struck down ten, or struck down a thousand men. Isn't it funny that even if the enemy tries to tie you, God is greater. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Even if the enemy ties you up for a season, know this, there is freedom. God will give you the power and the strength to overcome because you are an overcomer. You see, conquerors have conquered things. They have the right weapons. They have the right tenacity, the right strength. But you're called more than a conqueror. You have the power of God upon you at the proper times to overcome anything that comes your way. God will free you from the bound and the shackles of the enemy to be free to live as a sanctified, blood-bought saint of God. Amen? Amen. The power came on him and the ropes became on him like charred flax and the bindings dropped off of his hands. And Samson took what was near him, took the jawbone of a donkey. And in the power of God, God enabled him to defeat the enemy and he slew the enemy one at a time, thrown behind him. Every time he kills somebody, thrown behind. Before you know it, the enemy was all behind him and it wasn't in front of him. God wants you to know that. If you let God get you free, God will give you the tools to continue to move the enemy out of your way so that the enemy is behind you and victory is always before you. God will use you if you don't allow the enemy to tie you up. But even if you find yourself in a season where you're ensnared by the enemy, God will always give you the power, always give you the power to be in the position that he puts you, and that is free, free at last, as a blood-bought saint of God. Amen. Amen. So he kills these um, Philistines, and he moves on. But here's the problem. Now he comes, and in chapter 16... He goes to Gaza where he again saw a prostitute. Before he just claimed a lady, um, when he saw a Philistine woman, he demands his parents to go get her because he wants to marry her. There, Samson was using these women as objects to gratify him. He was lustfully looking at her and he used her to, to satisfy his own fleshly desires. <laughs> And that marriage, of course, didn't work out well because there was no love there. It was just lust. And so he was following the lust of the eyes. You know, there's that sin. Lust of the, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, boastful pride of life, right? All three of those will be the way that you fall to sin. For Samson, it was the lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes. He saw that girl back uh, when he demanded his parents to go get her. He saw her and he just used her as an object. Of course, when you're just falling in lust with somebody and not love, it never ends well. And because you don't see the woman properly as a creation of God and set apart for you uh, to be one with as a helpmate, you see this as an object to just fulfill your gratifi the gratification of your flesh, and it never works out. But here again, Samson now, he doesn't, he doesn't demand and use this, other, this new lady in Gaza. What he does here is he actually just pays for it. So he's got this, this problem. He's got something that's continuing to distract him and, and distract him from the plan that God has for his life. And it's called the lust of the eyes. He is going after women. He's going after a natural desire in the wrong way. So he's going after this lady in Gaza where he doesn't demand for her to come. In fact, he's just like, you know, I'm going to put down some money. So he buys this prostitute and he spends the night with her. Well, when you buy something like that when you, you you can't just buy your wife you don't pay for for you know relationship with a woman and expect it to work out well well it didn't work out well the enemy comes here and again tries to destroy him and he rips off the gates and he uh, you know gets away and escapes but now he falls in love with a lady in named Delilah in chapter 16 we see Samson going from being ensnared by demanding women and using them as objects to now he uh, went to a prostitute and tried that, but there was no love there as well. But now in chapter 16, we see Samson after the woman at Gaza. He now falls in love with this lady named Delilah. She's almost certainly a Philistine, um, but so were the other two. So it's not a surprise here that Samson's still looking at the wrong type of woman. But he falls in love with her. And uh, the rulers of the Philistine went to her and said, See if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him so that we may subdue him and tie him up. Each one of us will give you 
1100 shekels of silver. So does she love Samson? Well, I don't think she loves Samson. What she loves is the fact that each one of these rulers are going to give her 1100 shekels of silver. So she's going to do quite a bit here for money. And the enemy is trying to bring this man down through the use of a woman who is solely in love with money. Hmm. So Delilah said to Samson, tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. And now what Samson does here is he begins to tell her things, which of course don't reveal where the power of his strength comes from. But what they do are they get very close to what removes the strength. So this is a step ladder to showing how much closer each time he gets to telling her the very thing that she wants to know. And all along, she's wondering, why aren't you telling me? You don't love me? But what Samson is doing is he's looking over the fence. He is looking over the fence. Listen to this. Samson answers, if anyone ties me with seven fresh thongs that have not been dried, I'll become weak as any other man. So if she does that, that doesn't work. Then Delilah said to Samson, you've made me a fool. He said then in verse 11, if anyone ties me securely with new ropes, that have never been used, I'll become as weak as any other man. So she does that, he breaks those. So Delilah says to Samson, until now you've been making a fool of me. Tell me how you can be tied. So now he's gonna get closer to telling her the truth because he loves this woman. He replied, if you, have, if you weave the seven braids of my head into the fabric on a loom and tighten it with a pin, I'll become as weak as any other man. So while he was sleeping, Delilah took the seven braids, wove them into the fabric, and tightened it with a pin. Again, she called him Samson. Look, the Philistines are upon you. So he, he jumps up, wakes from his sleep, and he pulls the pin in the loom with the fabric. And then she said, how can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? This is the third time that you have fooled me or made me a fool and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. When she continued to nag and prod, when she prodded him and nagged him all the time, this was her mode of operation day in and day out. Samson finally broke down and told her the secret to his strength. And he says, no razor has ever been used on my head. He said, because I have been a Nazarite set apart to God since birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me and I would become as weak as any other man. It's interesting that Samson has said this, this verse or this phrase over and over. I will become like any other man. What is Samson doing? I believe that Samson's making a lot of bad choices. He's opening up his heart. He's revealing things to a lady that he's, he claims to be in love with, but doesn't have that reciprocal love back. You see, the enemy has got him in a place where he is enamored by a woman. He thinks he is in love with her and that he is going to bear his heart to a woman that is only out for his destruction. And what does he do? He begins to slowly tell her, look, if you do this, I'll become like an, any other man. If you do this, I'll become like any other man. And she asked him a third time, and he says, if you take my hair and weave it into the fabric of a loom and then tighten it with a pin, I'll become like any other man. He's getting closer. He's wearing down. He's telling her a little bit more and more of what she needs to hear until finally after the prodding and the nagging day in and day out, he finally says, look, I love you. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to reveal everything in my heart. I'm going to lay it bare to you. What is my strength? And he tells her, if you shave my head, no razor has ever touched my head because I've been set apart from birth as a Nazarite unto God. But if you shave my head, I'll be like any other man. You see, Samson has been tricked by the enemy to love and live solely for women instead of his purpose and mission for God. Samson has slowly shown this woman that he in his heart is battling with the purpose and call that God has on his life. Samson really never wanted to be a Nazarite set apart to God from birth. How do we know that? If we look back at the, the chapters previous, 14, 15, into, into 16, what did Samson do? He despised, in a sense, 
his, his set-apartness, his holiness, his Nazarite vows, Nazarite commitment that God birthed him into. Like many of us, when, when God calls us into his kingdom, he gives us a plan, and, and we're to be thankful for that. We're to say, that's my goal, that's my purpose of my life, is to do what God has shown me. And we are to embrace that and thank the Lord God that we have a purpose now in the kingdom and that we can be used of God to reach and affect eternity in people's lives. Samson was kind of not, I don't want this. I didn't ask for it. And so what does he do early on? Early on, he demands that he get a woman. And he kills a lion. And he has a feast. He drinks. He touches the unclean. All along, he has done everything he's not supposed to do. But yet the power of God is still on him. Why? Because God is in control of Samson's calling and his life. This is God at work, Samson. You cannot deny what God wants to do through your life to affect people by working through and defeating the enemy and showing people there's freedom on the other side. There's freedom on the other side if you just ask for the forgiveness. There's the shackles that will be removed. Samson, why don't you want to be what God's called you to be? Because he was toyed with by the enemy to look not at the finish, not at the purpose of God, but at the things of this world. And he despised God's purpose in his life because he had this internal struggle of, I think women would be better. I think being able to eat honey out of a dead carcass and using God's, God's uh, purpose or strength in my life for my own plan, I want to do what I want to do because I want to be just like any other man. That's why I wanted to marry the girl in Timna. That's why I wanted to, to, to sleep with the prostitute. That's why I'm in love with Delilah. I just want to have a normal life. Well, God has bought you by the precious blood of the Lamb to give you the best life, not the life that you so want by looking over across the enemy's field. God wants you to keep focused on the author and perfecter of the faith and finish well. So keep your eyes on the finish. Stay focused on the finish because God will use you for his glory to defeat the enemy and bring people into the kingdom of God. As you bring forth the gospel, God will work in mighty ways and chains will fall and people's hands will be untied and no longer will they be under the rule of the Philistine or under the enemy, the devil but free to live as God purposed them to live in Christ. Samson basically says, look, I'm going to tell you how to take away my strength because I want to be just like every other man. And when he does, he tells her the key to his strength. She knows that's what it is. She's seen this man reveal to her his entire heart. And so his hair is shaved, and Samson wakes up, and unbeknownst to him, God has left him. God's left him. He's like, you want to go your own way? Y'all like sheep have gone astray. Each of you have turned to your own ways. <laughs> but the Lord has caused all the iniquities that we have to fall on him. <laughs> Why would you want to run your own way, Samson? Do you want to taste that? Here's what happens. The enemy will strip you of your power. The enemy will confuse you. And he'll, he'll show you the false, the false goal. He'll tempt you with things that are only imitations of what God has for you. And in the end, it will fail you. Delilah was nothing more than an object to sidetrack Samson from the purpose that God had for him. And it cost Samson dearly to despise the Lord's purpose and calling on his life and to live in the enemy's camp with the enemy's women, listening and giving out God's plan for his life to people who only wanted to destroy it and make sure it never came to pass. Samson's hair was cut off and God's power was removed from him and the Philistines took him and they gouged out his eyes. They blinded this man to the truth of what God had for him. And that's the plan of the enemy, to gouge out as many eyes of men. Have you ever noticed that it's only men who are blind in the Bible? Because if you can get to the man, if you can get to the dad of the family, you pretty much have got the rest of the family. If you can blind the male figure, the leader in the family to the word of God, if you can blind the man to anything that God has for you, I've got the rest of the family. i got the wife, i got the kids for generation and generation to come, the enemy says. Samson's eyes were gouged out, but because God 
God is who he is and God's plans will never be thwarted. God does as he pleases and nothing can stop the plans of God. Samson's hair began to grow. Just like in some of your lives, you can sense the call of God in your life and your hair is beginning to grow and the power of God is beginning to wrestle within you and stir you and you realize greater is he who is in me than who is in the world and you're saying no to things right now. You're saying, devil, I'm done doing this. I'm done living in your house. I am moving out. You have no control over me any longer. Right as Samson's hair began to grow, he began to receive the power and the vision of what God had given him since birth. And he knew that he had to finish just one more time, God. Give me the strength just one more time. And God granted that wish. Why? Not because of who he was, but because it was God's plan from the beginning. You cannot thwart God's plans. And so God continued to use Samson even to the very end. And in his death, when he stood against those pillars and he cried out to God just one more time, God said, Amen. This is my plan. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you the strength one more time and watch what you're going to do. You will be what I said you would be in chapter 13. You will begin to be the deliverance for Israel from the Philistines. And you will kill more people in your death than you have all along by trying to fight this inner struggle. And Samson reared out to those pillars and he, with one push, he shoved those pillars and all the rulers of the Philistines came crashing in and were killed. And in the end, God's word stood true because God knows the, be the end from the beginning. <laughs> he knew this was coming. And in Samson's death, he fulfilled God's promises that Samson would begin to be the deliverance of Israel from the Philistines. He will begin the deliverance of Israel from the hands of the Philistines, chapter 13, verse 5. I wonder what God is doing in your life. I wonder what plan God's put in, in, in motion and you've been tied up. Well, it's time to untie you so that you can continue on with the purpose and plan that God has for you. God is saying to you, be strong, my child, my daughter. Be strong in the Lord. I'm untying your hands and I'm going to give you a jawbone and you're going to continue on in this fight. You're going to overcome the enemy and I will use you in the end. No matter how much you're sidetracked, if you just cry out to me one more time, I'll free you for the purpose that I have designed you for. Amen? Gosh, there is glory. There is freedom in following the Lord. Don't get sidetracked by all that the enemy has in this world. This world is passing. It's all going to come to nothing. The only thing that lasts is the one that does the will of the Father, the Bible says. So keep your eyes focused on the author and perfecter of your faith. Don't let these little eye wanderings and, and, and these desires for the things of this world ensnare you and entrap you to the kingdom of the enemy. You don't belong to be there. You're a child of the king. If you're in the Lord, if you're in the Lord's house, if you're a citizen of God's kingdom and a member of his household, by simple faith in Jesus Christ, you have been set free. And so I pray today that you would walk in that freedom because God has a plan for you. It's not over. No matter how many times the enemy sidetracks Samson in the Bible, it's not over until God says it's over. And when it's over, God's mission is complete. And he'll bring you home. If you're still breathing today, God's got a plan and he's still bringing it, bringing it about in your life. You just have to say, untie my hands and help me keep my faith, my eyes focused on the finish because I know there's a plan and a purpose for my life. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. I pray that you would be blessed. I pray that you would say no more to this world, keeping your eyes focused on the author and perfecter of your faith, Jesus Christ, knowing he's got a plan for you. And that plan's been in place before the foundations of this world were ever even thought of. And that is that you would be holy and set apart for God's purposes and know that he is willing it to become purely the purpose of your life. I pray today, I pray today that you would see the love of your Father. I pray today that you would see that Jesus has a plan for you. He sets you on a course for success because he's crazy in love with you. And he wants to see you utilized for how he's purposed you to be. That is as a set-apart child of God with a plan and a purpose that will affect eternity, not just for you, 
but for others around you. Say no to the enemy. Keep your eyes focused on the finish. God will lift you up. God will bring you through. God will untie your hands to do what he's called you to do. And if he's called you to do it, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Amen. God bless you. In Jesus' name, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity just to know that we can be used by you. Father, I pray for those today that are bound by the enemy, that you would loose them, Lord. God, that they would cry out for one more opportunity. Lord Jesus, show them that they are free and free indeed. Lord God, I thank you that you've got a plan for each of us. I thank you that you have a plan to reach people today who are without hope and without a God in this world. Father, use us not to condemn, but use us, Lord Jesus, to show there is no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Help us to be a light in this dark world that you might be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week for Easter. Until then, God bless you.